Hello everyone, this is Mr. Seymour, and in this lesson we're going to look at equal rights, which is the struggle towards fairness and equality and equal treatment. We're going to be focusing a lot on the 14th Amendment in this particular lesson, so let's go on and look at our lesson objectives. After you've read the chapter, you should be able to do each of the following things. First, distinguish between civil liberties and civil rights and determine whether constitutional devices that were intended to provide equality under the law have been successful. Next, describe the impact and evolving interpretation of the 14th Amendment on individual liberty. Third, detail the provisions of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and 1968 and the Voting Rights Act of 1964 and 1965 and describe the debate over affirmative action. Fourth, distinguish among reasonable basis, strict scrutiny, and intermediate or almost suspect scrutiny tests and comment on the implicit assumptions about the appropriate means and ends that underline each of these. Next, we're going to trace the development of measures to promote racial equality in America and concentrate on the most significant milestones and analyze the actions that have proven necessary in order to achieve them. And lastly, we're going to discuss the similarities and differences among the dilemmas that have been faced by and the strategies implemented and the rewards that have been gained by the respective struggles of African Americans, of women, and other historically disadvantaged groups in the United States. The United States, even though it placed so much of its foundation in founding this country on the words equality and liberty, um, had a very nasty legacy of segregation that led, of course, up to the Civil War. After the Civil War, though, in order to try to address the problems of segregation, three amendments were passed. These were called the Freedom Amendments. The 13th Amendment required the states to end slavery. The 14th Amendment required the states to recognize and to protect everybody equally under the law for all citizens either born or naturalized. The 15th Amendment gave all men over 21 the right to vote regardless of race or previous servitude, or which would be slavery. But after Reconstruction would come to an end in the 1870s and 80s, black votes would become stifled and the rights of black voters would be impeded by what would become known as Jim Crow laws. So we're going to look at the origins of those laws. In June of 1892, Homer Plessy, a man who was seven-eighths white and one-eighth black, refused to sit in the colored car of a railroad train in Louisiana, even though his employer had purchased a first-class pass for him. That was because Louisiana law forbade blacks from sitting in the same train car as whites, so Plessy was arrested and fined $25. The judge, his name was Ferguson. This case was argued before the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court approved a policy that would become known as separate but equal, which means that as long as you had separate but equal facilities, the segregation of the races was perfectly legal and encouraged. So the Supreme Court would say that separate facilities for blacks and whites were constitutional as long as they could be proven equal. But who could decide what equal was? This led to a series of laws which would be known as Jim Crow laws. There are basically two types of segregation and we see both of them as we examine civil rights. The first type of segregation is known as de jure or by law. The problem with de jure segregation is that the law specifically called for or allowed 
the segregation of the races. For instance, Jim Crow laws that allowed for separate but equal facilities. An example, separate but equal facilities like water fountains, restrooms, theaters, and schools. The solution to de jure segregation is simply force the law to be changed. The best example is Brown versus Board of Education, which this decision ended segregation in schools, the K-12 schools, and it forced the states to begin ending Jim Crow laws, which would take time. The Brown case unanimously found that separate is inherently unequal. The 14th Amendment and its Equal Protection Clause forbids the states from denying equal protection to citizens on the basis of their um, race, creed, nationality. And still, we had a great deal of segregation, especially in schools up to the 1950s, after the Plessy-Ferguson decision. The Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas decision banned the forced segregation of schools. But even 15 years later in the 1960s and early 1970s, there was little change. So the Supreme Court encouraged busing as a solution to desegregate the schools. This was a highly controversial policy and it had mixed results. This policy of busing officially ended in 2007, but there is still substantial segregation through things like white flight, where uh, people leave certain neighborhoods and go to others in order to segregate themselves. The second type of segregation is called de facto segregation, which means by practice or by fact. The problem with de facto segregation comes from people choosing to segregate themselves or to reinforce local or regional customs which allow for self-selected segregation. And the best example is the problem of white flight from the 1960s and 70s. The solution was to force people to change their practices and their traditions. This is where the busing policies of the 1970s come in. And this was one way to try to force people to desegregate by taking children from white neighborhoods in the um, suburbs and busing them to the inner city schools and taking from the, the kid, children from the inner city neighborhoods and busing them to the schools in the suburbs. It didn't work because it's much harder to get people to change their habits, their customs, and their practices than it is to get them to change the law. And in fact, Boston became a much bigger problem with segregation than Atlanta during the 1970s and the 1980s. There are three tests that the court use to determine the level to which scrutiny from the courts should be applied to possible discrimination. The first level is called the strict scrutiny test, and this is the highest level. This is called the suspect category, where it is assumed that practices are unconstitutional in the absence of an overwhelming justification. So these apply to race and ethnicity, your suspect classifications. Intermediate scrutiny means that more suspicion is placed it is assumed that the behavior or the actions are unconstitutional unless the law serves a clearly compelling and justified purpose, and this mostly applies to gender. So, for instance, segregating restrooms, women and men, that is allowed because there's a compelling and justified purpose. But allowing for, for instance, women to be paid less than men is not a compelling and justified purpose. Now the third and least restrictive test is the reasonable basis test. And this is the test that says that basically this kind of discrimination is not suspect. It is assumed that the behaviors and practices of the government or 
of an employer or of a school are constitutional unless there is no sound rationale for the law that can be provided. This applies to age, it applies to income, it also applies to other classifications. In this chart we have a, um, a list of the three tests. The strict scrutiny test, which applies to race and ethnicity. This is your suspect category. It is assumed that discriminatory practices or possibly discriminatory practices are unconstitutional in the absence of an overwhelming justification. The next level is intermediate scrutiny, and this applies to gender. Almost, this is the almost suspect category. It is assumed that practices are unconstitutional unless the law serves a clearly compelling and justified purpose. So for years, excluding women from the military would have been considered a clearly compelling and justified purpose. Not allowing women to serve in a combat role, not allowing them to serve on a, uh, on a um, submarine. Um, separating your, your restrooms in, a, in an office workplace. Now the third category is reasonable basis. And reasonable basis is anything, any other category which might include things like age and income and, can include, and include many other kinds of categories as well. This is the not suspect category. It is assumed that the practices uh, are constitutional unless no sound rationale for the law can be provided. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 dealt with accommodations and jobs. And it basically said that public accommodations cannot be refused to anyone and that businesses cannot refuse to serve customers based on race. Most employers cannot refuse to consider the race of an applicant when applying for a job either. And both of those are covered under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The black civil rights movement was the impetus behind the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The busing boycott, led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his march on Washington for jobs and freedom, were a very important part of getting this movement off the ground. But th even though there was strong re resistance to the Civil Rights Act, uh, from those that it was being applied to. Ultimately, the attempts at the federal government to desegregate and to end the de jure segregation um, ultimately were successful. Let's look here at today how different ethnicities identify with for instance, the Democratic Party. You'll notice that African Americans, 94% of them identify with the Democratic Party, 70% of Hispanics, 47% of white women, 39% of white men, and 41% of white Southerners. Now, if you had gone back in time to the 1950s, this would have been completely different. Why? Because the Democratic Party of the 1950s was incredibly conservative, and it was what we called the Dixiecrats. Today, though, especially following the Civil Rights Act, of, uh, the Civil Rights era in the 1960s, the, there was a, a, a shift in voter identification with the political parties, with most of the minorities starting to identify with the, the Democratic Party and those that had been Dixiecrats in the South identifying with the Republican Party. The movement towards women's rights really has its foundation in the Seneca Falls Convention of the 1840s. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was the one that organized this convention. And it wouldn't be for another 60 years that women would acquire the right to vote, not till 1920, with the 19th Amendment. And then most recently we've had the failure of the Equal Rights Amendment 
which passed Congress but failed to be ratified by a very narrow margin in some of the states. We didn't get enough states to ratify it. So with regard to women's rights, there is a mixed bag of uh, success and failure, mostly, unfortunately, failure over the years. We're just now starting to see a time in which 50% of our population are women, 51 actually, yet for the most part women have experienced um, difficulties in getting and keeping jobs, maintaining um, pay at the same rate that a man does, and even obtaining the jobs they want like in the military. So there's a long history here with regard to women and equal rights. Hispanic Americans and farm worker strikes were the first real sense that we had that uh, Hispanics were rising up as a class. And strikes in the 1960s and 70s were largely for migrant workers' rights, and most of these were successful in California. Native Americans and their long delayed rights are a sad history in the United States. Native Americans weren't granted citizenship until 1924. Uh, there was a series of protests in the 1970s. As a result, they were given greater control over their own affairs. In 1968, uh, Native Americans were able to get the Indian Bill of Rights, but still, um, there is greater poverty and um, disparity amongst Native American populations. And so we see, even today, uh, the results of discrimination and oppression. Now, with regard to Hispanics, Hispanic Americans and farm workers strikes led by, for instance, Cesar Chavez in the 1960s and 70s, were largely a part of representing migrant workers' rights, and they mostly were successful in California. When we look at Native Americans and their long-delayed rights, they didn't even get citizenship until 1924, and they probably have the worst, um, the worst record of being mistreated uh, with regard to an entire race just being set aside. Protests in the 19... With regard to Asian Americans and immigration, um, there has always been a double standard policy where Asian Americans had a much, much harder time getting into the United States and staying in the United States. The average stay for somebody who came in through Ellis Island from Europe was maybe three days. The average stay for somebody coming to Angel Island could be anywhere from three months to a year, and most of them did not get admitted because there were such strict restrictions on Asian immigration. Now, this tradition ended in 1965, and since then there have been some legal victories in the field of education, and that's good. But still, Asian Americans have had a history of discrimination, legalized discrimination. For instance, internment during World War II for the Japanese. This slide shows <clears throat> a progression starting in the 1950s where 78% of the immigrants coming in were coming from Europe and coming from Canada. And 3% from Asia and only 16% from Latin America. And if you fast forward another 50 years, in 2010, 11% were coming in from Europe, 35% from Asia, and another 53% from Latin America, meaning that 88% of new immigrants were coming from either Asia or Latin America, and less than 11% we're actually coming from Europe and Canada. One of the most critical yet effective ways of limiting civil rights has always been through the election 
process through the poles. And in the 1940s, for instance, uh, you had whites only primaries where only white people could vote in the primaries and in those states where they voted most of the time the decisions were made in the primaries so by the time you voted in the general election it was too late. Those ended by the late 1940s. The 24th Amendment would prohibit poll taxes, the, pay, the charging of a tax in order to vote in the 1960s. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 would allow federal agents to oversee the voter registration process. It would prevent states from creating election districts that deliberately dilute the minority vote or give it control. And that's called gerrymandering. It weakened significantly uh, the power of the states until 2013. And now the power of the states are starting to return because the decision of Shelby County versus Holder uh, basically is giving the states back the supervision over the election process and the redistricting process. The federal government does not have the power it did uh, uh, through the Voting Rights Act in 1965. They said by 2013, that was almost 50 years ago, it didn't really matter. If you look at Texas, it really does matter because we are a, a really notorious state for gerrymandering, which is redistricting lines deliberately in order to keep groups out. Now, the Civil Rights Act of 1968 was specifically there to address problems dealing with housing and poverty, particularly the problem of discrimination not wanting to rent a house to someone of color or someone of an ethnicity that you didn't want. Prohibiting red redlining, which was a policy that um, lenders would use where they would go in, or, or also real estate companies, they would go in and they would redline out a district and say, we aren't going to rent or sell to any minorities in this area to allow it to become a white-only district and allow the property values to go up. But even now, 50 years almost later, there are strong patterns of housing segregation. African Americans and Hispanics still have more difficulty in obtaining a mortgage than a white, similar white family does with a comparable income level. And the question is why? And the answer oftentimes is discrimination. We previously mentioned the problem of de facto and de jure discrimination. Affirmative action is supposed to focus on the equality of a result. Getting someone into school, getting someone admitted to a law school or a medical school, getting someone a job. De facto discrimination is all about social, economic, and cultural bias and choice. De jure discrimination if you remember, is by law. It's easy to change the law. It's not so easy to change people's behavior. So the idea of affirmative action was to come up with a policy that would somehow equalize the playing field. And it has had mixed results. But there are a lot of people that would argue that they did not become a doctor or an attorney without affirmative action. The objective of affirmative action is full and equal opportunities for everyone in education and employment. The controversy is the ends versus the means. The way in which we choose to select under affirmative action can also be argued to be reverse discrimination. Now, there have been three laws or three cases which have, for the most part, upheld the use of affirmative action, but the courts are finding less and less in favor of affirmative action. The first is the University of California Regents versus Bach case in 1978. The second is the Adiron versus Paney case in 1995. And the third is the Schwett versus the Coalition to Defend Affirmative Action in 2014. And what you have to see is that over time, affirmative action is under attack. Now you have the new case it's going to be reheard 
and that's the case of Abigail Fisher, the uh, Fisher versus Texas case in which she was denied entry into the University of Texas because she did not get into the top 10% of her school and UT has this top percentage policy. At that time it was 10%. Now I think it's down to 6 The idea was to get a more uh, diverse student body because not every school is going to have the same level of educational attainment for their graduates. So an African American school or an inner city Hispanic school would have the same opportunity of putting a child or, uh, into the University of Texas as would an all-white prep school. So Abigail Fisher's argument is, well, there are people that were admitted to UT that had much worse GPAs and SAT, ACT scores than I did. And that may be true. But the university is going to say, but we have to do something to fairly diversify our student population. And that's the defense. In looking at African Americans and civil rights today, we can see from Ferguson and Baltimore and other recent issues, especially the Black Lives Matter uh, debate, the aftermath of the civil rights movement has still left African Americans with a continually high disparity in income, with discrepancies in uh, convictions and sentencing guidelines, with a high rate of dissolution of black families and a feeling that they cannot socially or economically move within um, our social stratus, and movement into political office has been challenged as well. The next slide is really about the debate over family structure. If you look at Asian families, 81% of Asian families have two parents, 19% are single parent families. If you look at white non-Hispanics, it's about 80-20. When you get to Hispanics, it's about 62-38. But with regard to black families, 44% have two parents in the home, and more than 56% have only one parent or no parent in the home. So, is this evidence of economic or social disparity? Is it definitely something we have to pay attention to as we consider outcomes versus the way in which we account for or try to accommodate for differences amongst the ethnic groups. With respect to women, there are still challenges to electoral and political successes. Women have a much harder time in becoming elected officials. And this, is, this has been referred to as a glass ceiling. In regards to employment, women now have much more mobility, but in regards to politics, women don't have as much mobility. You also have job-related issues, lack of job equality, uh, problems with family leave, gender pay equity, and uh, problems with sexual harassment, and this issue that has been described by sociologists as the feminization of poverty, where single mother-led households tend to be the poorest, and that means that women tend to pay the price for having children, and economically, oftentimes, they tend to end up in poverty. And this should not be the case, but it is. So again, let's look at the sociology of the problem. Six percent of families are two-parent families that live in poverty. If a male heads the family, it's 16%. But if it's a, f a single family headed by a female, 32% of them are in poverty. So it's only 6% of two-parent families are in poverty. 16% of single families headed by a male are in poverty. And 32% of those that are headed by a female. Now, question is, it's almost a chicken and the egg question. Is this because of 
uh, discrimination against women or is it because women tend to be the, ch the caregivers for children and oftentimes are the ones that get custody of the children in a divorce which is 50 percent of the cases anymore you can argue those things back and forth Native Americans have been fighting back trying to file lawsuits to regain lost land dealing with the negative discrepancies in health care wealth and education and they have seen incomes rise because of uh, Native American casinos, but that becomes also controversial because are you making them dependent on something that basically is a, um, it's gambling. And should they be dependent upon gambling to make a living? In El Paso, it's not hard for us to understand that Hispanic Americans have fa had a tough struggle with regard to equality. There's le immigration and legal residence issues. The fact that Hispanics across the country are the fastest growing minority. And we have had electoral success, but not as much as we should or you should. Uh, we're looking by 20... 25 or so, uh, having more than 60% of the population in Texas becoming Hispanic, yet we still see that this state is going to be controlled by rich white men. So why? And a lot of it has to do with the, particip the participation rates of Hispanics in elections. Just look at this chart from the United States Census Bureau that shows the prediction of population in the United States, starting back in 1970 to 2050. And what you can see in millions is that in 1970, there were 9.6 million Hispanics in the United States. It is projected that by 2050, there will be 102.6 million Hispanics in the United States. And that's a tremendous rise. Look at the trend. It's a tremendous rise in population. With regard to Asian Americans, there are about 12 million Asian Americans in this country. Asian American communities tend to emphasize academic achievement. They are an upwardly mobile group, but there is still significant discrimination that hinders Asian Americans from gaining high level positions within companies. There's not a lot of Asian American CEOs, much more white Caucasian rich men. This brings us to the issue uh, and continuing struggle for gays and lesbians. There have been legal victories, Romer versus Evans, Lawrence versus Texas, which basically forbade states from making it illegal for two consenting adults to have um, homosexual sex. Don't ask, the repeal of the Don't Ask, Don't Tell Act of, ni of 2010, uh, 10, in 2010. Gays and lesbians can now openly serve in the armed services. In 2013, the Supreme Court invalidated part of the Defense of Marriage or DOMA Act, allowing same-sex couples the same federal benefits as male and female couples. And same-sex marriages have been recognized in several states throughout the uh, country, and there's been legislative and judicial action, and now the Supreme Court has said it's the law of the land and that um, LGBT couples are considered a protected class. And this is an area where the country is pretty evenly divided. If you look at all adults and you ask them, are you in favor or against same-sex marriage? Um, in 1996, 27% of all adults said they were in favor. And today, 53%. So that's almost double the numbers. In 1996, 41% of those ages 18 to 29 said yes. Now it's 70%. In, in uh, 1996, 30% of people ages 30 to 49 said that they were in favor of same-sex marriage, and now that's 53%. And this is very amazing amongst older adults. Adults 50 to 64, only 15% said they were in favor of the idea of same-sex marriage back in 1996, and now it's 46%. It's not over 50%, but it's 46%. And then when you get over 65, 
1996, only 14% said they approved, and now it's 41%. So there is growing recognition for same-sex couples and same-sex marriage and the right to be married. The Oberfell versus Hodges case is the case that was decided this summer. And this is the one that says that uh, the Supreme Court ruled that denying or failing to recognize same-sex marriages by national, state, county, and local levels of government was unconstitutional. It forces a direct conflict between those who stand in First Amendment rights to religious freedom and those who argue that the government is not supposed to be in the business of determining or enforcing moral laws with regard to consenting adults. It essentially recognizes the LGBT community as a protected class under the 14th Amendment. Older Americans are considered disadvantaged in some ways with respect to employment opportunities. There is age discrimination. There is an Age Discrimination Act, an Age Discrimination and Employment Act, but it's very hard to prove. Discrimination on the basis of age is still considered at the lowest level of presumption with regard to civil rights laws, and age discrimination is very difficult to prove in court. As a result, there is a greater opportunity for equality between the disabled and the able-bodied. Disabled Americans, you have the Disabled uh, Americans with Disabilities Act of 1991, which has had several positive impacts. It has improved access to public buildings, it provided accommodations with regard to public services and conveyances. It's improved employment and educational opportunities for the disabled. And essentially, it has worked. Um, this, this has been one of the more successful fights for civil rights among disabled Americans. And it's going to become even more important as we start to get our disabled vets Again, America's high ideals often clash with its history. We want to be an egalitarian uh, society, one based on equality, yet at the same time it's not easy to do. And there has been a frequent tendency or desire to avoid the retelling of the negative aspects of American history, but it must be done. And so, to repeat what Martin Luther King said in August of 1963, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. The question that I would have is, has that dream come true? Or are we still as far away from it as we were back in 1963? And I'll leave you with that thought as we go on this week with your chapter on civil rights.